Today on Lady Boss, Courtney sits down with entrepreneur, author, and social media superstar, John Sarasani, to discuss how he transitioned from the corporate world to entrepreneurship and how he's building an online brand by helping people get that 2,000% raise. All right, so John, you just yep. referred, you know, the power of the internet is that we're sitting here today finding each other through the internet, yep. which is cool because you're really only 20 miles apart, but exactly. we probably wouldn't have connected as fast. So um, why do you uh, why do you spend so much energy and money on the content <laughs> you're producing? Uh, great question. You know, I sold my company in 2015. I had a five-year employment contract. Anybody that's ever sold a company... That five years, whatever your employment contract is, a lot of people, it's only six months. Mine was five years because the nature of the business and it made sense. But it was four and it was the longest 48 months of my life. But yeah. So you know what I mean? <laughs> there's there's a lot of there's a lot of incentives those first three years with the earnout. Those last two years, I was like, why are we here? They didn't want me here. I didn't want to be there. But contractually, I wasn't able to get fired. Contractually, I wasn't able to quit. Um, so, you know, then that finishes up right at the end of 2019. I have a little fun. Finally, I could celebrate. I made all this money. You know what I mean? I didn't really get to celebrate in 2015 because the next day I was working. Yeah, working for again. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I went through a period there where I kind of had a lot of fun. Bahamas, Vegas, L.A., you know, all that stuff. Uh, thank goodness I have my kids to keep me somewhat grounded. Right. You know what I mean? There's something to come back home for. But, you know, then the pandemic hits. Yep. All right. Then we're sitting there and I'm like, you know what? I, I started to kind of feel like... Uh, I didn't like how it sounded coming out of my mouth. I'm retired. How old are you? Like it, it started to kind of like sound pretentious saying it. Yeah. So I start dabbling in venture capital and doing some angel investing, um, got involved with some maybe high profile types of founders of celebrity in nature. And then the social media stuff, I just started talking about it. It kind of took a life of its own on. And I'm like, you know what? I need to rewrite a book. I need to write a book again. I had written one in 2011 and, um, why not do a podcast then? And, and I saw this gravitation of people coming towards me because of, of the message, which was second nature to me, but it was something new for other people because a lot of people just aren't talking about what I'm talking about on the internet. So agree. I like your, um, your, you, like, I wasn't sure if I would expect the guy on the, on the page or this guy. It's a little bit different. I have an alter, alter ego. All right, let's go, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so that's how you bring it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm both all the time, really, to be honest with you. It's, it depends on the question you ask me. So who's your audience when you really look at online? Initially, I thought my audience was going to be high-paid, business-to-business salespeople that need to open their eyes, that they could pivot outside of corporate America and be entrepreneurs and make that much more money. Same. That person making 250 grand a year in a tech sales or insurance sales job, hey buddy, that's a bribe to keep you working there. You could, the, sales is the hardest part of a lot of jobs. So pivot out, do this on your own, and then you might be able to retire early before you're 40 like I did. But the, the message got so broadened that people were just like, motivated by it besides that audience that audience appreciated to this day i get dms like i feel you man i feel you but then i'm getting like cops that have side hustles that are hey do you i listen to you because when i'm 54 i get to retire early and collect pension i ain't gonna be done yet now i'm gonna apply a bunch of the stuff i've learned from you you know and really every, everything in between so do you think your goal is like are you happy if people listen and quit their day job and become an entrepreneur <laughs> um if they're successful at it I, i'm not you know if, if people really listen to my message you know I, I'll, I'll post things that are lifestyle things i see what i'm doing every day and like i have this freedom but i also will sprinkle in enough where if they're paying attention they're going to say i worked my ass off i was prepared for it um, I talk about paid training. My, my, my wife is a W-2 employee in corporate America was my paid training for the company I'd start in the future. So that's my, my problem with this idea about everybody should be an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. I just want to get your opinion on this. I feel like in a way you're selling something that isn't achieved. You know, mm -hmm. you're the 1%, I'm the 1%. Mm -hmm. And guess what? There's 99 other people that might risk their entire future. Yeah. And they had a great two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year job, but a good yeah. salesman does not make a good business owner mm -hmm. all the time. Not all the time, exactly. And um, I actually get in my book here, two thousand percent raise. I talk about that evaluation process. All right. So the example I use when I left Arthur J. Gallagher, it's an insurance insurance brokerage. All right. 
I was making 140 grand a year. I brought in $800,000 of business. All right, they were paying me 140 to bring them 800. Wait a minute, no, 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 no. I'm paying you 660. What are they doing for me for that 660? And I could quantify that, okay? Support, training, technology, their name is getting me indoors. You do that math, Yeah. all right? Now, if you're a company that maybe manufactures an actual product, it's a little bit harder. Okay, okay, you're, you're selling something now that has a cost to it. You gotta add that into that formula. Yeah. And when you do that, okay, is that 250 that you just described, you know, are you better off or not? How much are you making the company? Would you be, you know what I mean? Because if you're, if you're gonna pay 250, you're making the company a lot more than 250. I mean, I, yeah. look, I was, I was a seller at a place. I worked for one of the most successful Chicagoans out of school and mm. my training. Nice. So why yeah. would I make in seven figures when I was 35? Why wow. did I jump off the Sears Tower? Because I wasn't fulfilled, right? Mm. So I was a money person. I think we have that. I mean, I, my metrics was money early yeah. on, like how much money, 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 money. It's not now that you, when you have all the money you want, it's yeah. like a different measurement. Like fulfillment actually matters today. Yeah. Or I'm getting too old, and that's why. But <laughs> the reality was um, they tried to say, you know, stay, it, you know, all the things em employers do. Mm -hmm. But I, I was able to go from great salesperson to great operator. Yeah. I just find a lot of great salesperson without a partner or a CFO, CTO, whatever it is. Yeah. They, maybe they can come out and make 250 but if you make 250 and you're running your own business and you were making 250 at a shop mm -hmm. you did not improve your situation that's um yeah i mean it's when now you look at it yeah, it's it the freedom you know you working twice as many hours now to make the same amount or do you feel right. like you have this freedom it depends what you want but but i think i was blessed in in, in that regard because a lot of sales people will, will never know if they're good operators until they try to go do it right mm -hmm. for me in the industry that i was in um this is going to sound bad, but but I was blessed to kind of have a service team that was transitioning when I started working there. Meaning I, there's a lot of things falling through holes. I didn't have the best account manager. I didn't have the best client service reps on my account. So here I am doing all the damn work, and then they're losing my accounts. I'm seeing this in the first six months. Yeah. After that, I ain't handing shit off to you anymore. Yeah. I start doing everything myself, yeah. and I... I I'm 25 years old. I'm teaching myself every phase of this yes. stuff to protect that 140 that I'm making. Yeah. So that's when things got so lopsided for me. I start looking at this like, well, wait a minute. I'm doing everything. So now it really just became for me, is that name getting me business or not? And it was to a degree, yep. but not to the percentage of, not proportionally. So, yeah. I mean, I think every, especially post-pandemic, every... Mm -hmm company has to like right size and reconcile the value they provide their employees like i'm 100 percent. you know it's yeah. not the old days of like where it's lopsided like it was i mean i don't right. i don't think that can exist in today's day because people are going to walk out the door because they can say i can get two accounts and be at my 140 or whatever so yeah. i think every every company needs to make sure the value they're providing their employees is high enough Right. But now you go off on your own. What do you think? What were you were young? So you weren't risking what you have now. But what was your biggest fear? Um, you know, I, I, it was a very calculated risk. Um, probably about six months before I left, I had already put it in my brain that I'm going to leave. Now we had that my industry is filled with non-competes. So you can't do, you know, the stealing of clients. That kind of stuff wasn't going to fly. The and I tell entrepreneurs this all the time. Last thing you want to do is start a new company and get sued by your former employer. That's and, and by the way, if your whole plan for your company is just to steal your old clients and that's that's your value proposition, you you, you better maybe just stick to that job. Um they're already paying you to Let's slow down. So let's say that again. Yeah. Because if you are going out in business to steal the clients you had at the past company, you're not a good business person. Exactly. Assume you will not talk to one of those people again Boom. and go get yourself new clients. That shows you a valuable salesperson. Yeah. I think it is the loserous move to like go and just try to like knock on the same door. Well, it's un and un unethical too. You know what unethical, I mean? Unethical. No value. That person was, you know, praying you a paycheck every week. You Exactly. You accepted that job to work there. You yep. did your best job. Now, the only thing I would maybe question myself, not really morally, but like just right okay where it's like okay those last few months when i knew i was, I was walking out the door i think everyone does that when they know they're about to quit a job maybe my prospecting efforts like okay i'm not gonna go to that conference this month i'll wait till next quarter so i don't have to show them a new business card at the same conference you know what i mean so you start like kind of you know wheelbarrowing your um your centers of influence a little bit but but that was all sales and and, and I, I gotta tell you like, like i said it, it's just <laughs> 
the the you know if, if you're lucky enough to be an indus in an industry where you are the product your consulting is the product now now you talk about value propositions that are around you you better offer more to your employees as a company for that salesperson a lot of times these companies will do this with product matter experts you know or specialists yeah. Yeah. Or, or whatever and gosh i gotta tell you it, it's smoke and mirrors and in insurance it, it really is if you're a smart dude or a smart woman and you want to work in that middle market and you're trained properly to do that you don't need to lean on these product matter experts or subject matter experts you, you just yeah, don't you don't have to know the stuff um yeah. the, the, the the problem is that there, you'll get a lot of people in insurance that are just good salespeople and have spreadsheets and stuff and they didn't bother to learn these mechanics that i was blessed with my first job out of college before i left the company i left um they had a very good training program um i was very blessed to have that position so now you're before we get to social again you're retired and how do you define having enough money to retire um, my benchmark, this isn't the number, but my benchmark, even if you talk about money and stuff, I always had a spreadsheet from when I was like 26 years old. Yeah. All right. If my net worth could be $10 million when I'm 40, I could live off 5% of that, which is half a million dollars a year. And that will, um, be more than a half a million dollars a year salary. Cause I'll just be paying long-term capital gains out instead of ordinary income. That's a nice life. So in my head, that was always kind of my plan. Like, okay, to be in a position to, to, to do that. All right. By 40. By 40. Exactly. And then what happened was, and I was on pace to do this and putting aside money. And by the way, people forget when, like, if you don't have a company to sell, like there's, it's very hard to accumulate that much money without things falling in place for you. Yeah. So, so I was right. around 34 years old and I'm making well, well into the seven years and I'm still putting that money aside. It, it, yeah. Exactly. This is a lot's going to have to, those <laughs> rental properties are going to have to go up in value if I'm ever going to get here. Um, uh, I wasn't going to be at it. I was going to be close to it probably or a little bit above it, but I, but I was way, making, I was way more successful than I thought I would have been. And my math was just wrong. But as I got closer, I'm like, well, then when I was 37, um, private equity backed competitor entered this okay. space and just blew the doors off that number for me. And, uh, just put me in a, this position where it's like, I didn't intend on selling the company. Yeah. It was just more of like, you know, so what, what's the phrase, uh, bird in hand worth, worth yeah. more than two in the bush. Yeah. And like, uh, I'm just this dude from Schomburg that was hoping to make 300 grand one day. And now you're going to put me in a position where my kids don't have to work if they don't want to, you know what I mean? And an idiot not to take this, yep. you know what I mean? Yep. So that's, that's what I did. And, and, and signed my life away for five years to five years of hell where I, I shouldn't say that the company that bought mine made me rich. So I shouldn't say that. Although there's other companies that would have bought me for the same amount. There's very competitive market. So whatever. Anyway. Well, I mean, you know, the, the, it's, um, Road to selling is is just yeah. that. I mean, they paid you a lot of money, and you just got to focus on that. So, yeah. okay. So you defined you could sit back and collect your your you know uh, interest money every day, but now you're it, it, are you trying to be famous? <laughs> I guess so. I don't know. I I, I can tell you that people always say, "What fuck it? You have a check?" <laughs> exactly. What, what's your agenda here, John? Um, I I will tell you this. Here's here's what keeps me going with this. I post on Instagram two or three times a day, and uh, I. I I interact with people it, like it's popular because I'm commenting back to people and replying to DMs. And That's I'm, you? Yeah, I'm okay. doing it all myself. I don't do it on TikTok, but Instagram I do. And um, I post on TikTok, but I don't, I'm not DMing people on that. Um, I shit you not. I know this is going to sound like bullshit, but I would guess three to five times a week on, on average, some weeks 20, some weeks zero. So I, I will get DMs either thanking me for giving them the motivation. I quit my job six months ago because of your posts. I'm making triple what I was making. I never heard from the guy. I, he didn't tell me he did this. He goes, your post kicked me in the ass to, to do this. Or, you know, I got one the other day from a 24-year-old kid. Hey, man, I just got out of uh, med or I'm in med school right now, and I'm changing the way I look at things, kind of reevaluating what I want to do with this. Thanks for, like, speaking the truth with this stuff. And I, and I think smart people will look at other influencers on Instagram and kind of see through it. They're kind of like rah, rah guys are just full of baloney or they're not really selling anything or they're just good at like sales marketing funnels to teach coaching project programs. And then they could actually see the shit I'm doing and say, okay, this guy's actually real. 
You know what I mean? And I don't think there's a lot of that right now. Probably because all the things you said, you put a lot of time and effort into it to really make no money, by the way. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, you can do that, right? Because you don't, this doesn't have to be a monetized thing, but you're also a guy who measures by mo monetizing. Mm -hmm. So are you happy if you just keep going on writing checks and don't monetize it? So for like this much time, I put together a, a like a coaching online university thing and you got to do that right on the internet. You got to hire closers. You got to build a sales funnel and you got to get emails that are artificial intelligence. And you're going back and forth. And I just did it for literally three days. I go, dude, turn this off. This is like, I don't want to do this. So fucking hustle this guy for seven grand. And it's not a hustle, but you know what? People start to believe their own bullshit. They start to believe like, if I just tell you my opinion on something and put it in the form of a video series and send you a freaking text messages, that you should pay me seven grand for that. And you know who the people that do that are? The people that are a little bit more on the desperate side and it yeah. ends up being their last seven grand. I don't, I'd rather not have that guy seven grand. Yeah. Because honestly, I don't have some secret formula for you to get rich. I could help you out and give you my advice and hopefully be a motivator for you. But there's no, there's no secret formula here. You know what I mean? So I think it's like, because I feel like when I watch you and I, I do look at some of your comments, I think, you're also really like appealing to some lower economic people that you're inspiring, you're motivating them. So is the fulfillment, you know, is the chip for you the like, thank you because you're giving back in a meaningful way? Yeah, for sure it is, for sure it is. And it's, it's, it's <laughs> the lower income people that like me, I, I don't necessarily think they're from Chicago. So then when they hear me talking about being from Schomburg, I, I think they think it's like a ghetto. Like they think I'm from Compton or something. <laughs> Just so everyone understands, Schomburg is a very middle class suburb. And, and, and I, I say it in the context of like, I, now my kids go to Barrington High School and it's all uppity and there's Hinsdale and Winnetka and, you know, all these other affluent suburbs around here. And Schomburg's just Schomburg, we're just normal. We're normal people in Schomburg. We don't go to country clubs and all this stuff, you know? So I'm from Schomburg. Well, well some people, I'll start getting, it's, it's awesome when one of my videos goes viral because it'll be people outside of my following will start to see it. And uh, like a guy like from the, like the south side of Chicago will comment, goes, what do you mean you're from Schomburg, bro? It's confused. People are like scratching their heads. I thought people from, or people from like, uh, you know, like maybe like Hanover Park or something like that. What are you talking about? Schomburg's the rich kids. You're, you know. Oh my gosh, so, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, um, I, I think a couple of things sitting with you, I realized that um, part of, you know, being online, you got to bring it, right? Yeah. The energy. And that that's a, not a tall task if you're you, but like, you know, it's a, three times a day to, to do it is, it's some days you don't feel like bringing it. Yeah. Um, how do you rally around that? I actually have the opposite. Like I literally wake up in the morning, <laughs> I'll like think of something and I'll videotape it. So I have all these damn reels sitting in my phone ready to be posted. And uh, I'm actually trying to slow myself down not to do three a day. But I, I, like, I'm like, okay, damn it. I'm not gonna post anything today. Oh, I can't help myself. I'm like addicted to it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, I literally drive in here today. I almost wanted to post one because something funny came to my mind. And anyway. Um, but but now I've I've put myself on probation. When I think of something, unless I know for sure it's going to be really good, I'll wait at least a few days before I post it. Let me make sure this is still effective and funny a couple of days from now, because I think I'm hilarious all the time. <laughs> I think everything I say is hilarious, and then I'll post it. And I'll be like, wait, why does this have no views? Or like, viewers, uh, exactly. So how what is your like? metrics right now so is it followers is it likes is it comments like how, you're 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 a kpi guy like, yeah you wouldn't be as successful so how do you measure it definitely views definitely views, views. Okay. And, and i learned that um with my audience um rather quickly to look at views instead of looking at likes all right so a little, little, little hint about instagram okay all right you press the like button other people could see that you press the like button you just view it no one could see that you viewed it Okay, so I got people. I'm remember. I'm a, a lot of my content is bashing corporate America. So if you're a W two employer, maybe you're a regional sales manager. And, <laughs> you know, you, you don't want you don't want people to know. So I got people, and, and I can always see followers versus non followers looking at my stuff too. I know for a fact there's people following my page that are not followers. You know what I mean? Or they follow from like burner accounts. Yeah. So I'm, I'm fine with that. So my, my views to likes ratio is, is never proportionate ever. Okay. So a lot of times I'll just hide my likes because unfortunately in social media land, 
it's such a metric people look at like the first oh how many looks does it have or or whatever and um you know if, if something has a hundred thousand views in normal circumstances it would have like five to ten thousand likes okay if it has a hundred thousand views all right that means it's doing well five to ten percent of the people are pressing the like button if i have a hundred thousand views it probably has like two thousand likes you know interesting yeah. Yeah. i think that that just exacerbates the whole thing you're talking about yeah. That yeah. they can't even like separate that they're so attached to that once a week somebody takes care of me. Yeah. God, that's so powerful. It really is. So if you split out and create a whole bunch of people that either have a side hustle, which I am all for. Yeah. I think everybody should have a side yeah. hustle. Yeah. Like work your way to the next level by, you know, if you can't fully take out the risk, you know? Yeah. And then take out the risk. But yeah. Become an entrepreneur full time. But I yeah. think Try it out before you, you know, commit all the way. And then some people got to commit. But mm -hmm. I think if you just like inspire a whole generation of people to think that it's not one company to take care of your entire lifespan. Yeah. And that you're in charge of that. That would be amazing. You know, so there's that. And then even broader than that, I've had, um, there's a woman actually in Philly. She's come, I have, a, I have a dinner this Saturday that I'm hosting in uh, Philadelphia. And she's flying in actually from, she's in Charlotte or something. She's not been in Philadelphia. She was making sure she could go to it. Um, she, she has multiple sclerosis. She's 54 years old and she has no interest in being an entrepreneur. She works corporate America, whatever. She resonated with some of the stuff I said. She got laid off of her job after doing well a few years back. So she, she jives with what I'm saying, but she's not really necessarily even wanting to be an entrepreneur, but she likes the content. And she sent me this really nice DM saying, um, you know, you could take your message and use it as an analogy or as a metaphor to, to so many other pieces of your life. Really, at the end of the day, you're trying to say, okay, society doesn't tell you what to do. You decide what you want to do. Just because just your society says you're in this box, you know what I mean? You, you don't have to be. Go do whatever you want. And her having MS and everything kind of really, really hit, hit home for that. My mom had MS too. And, and she didn't know that. So she's sending me this damn thing. And she's like, you know, for, for the last eight years, people are telling me how it's going to go with my multiple sclerosis. I'm like, screw that. I'm doing this. And, you know, she felt that in my message. So maybe at some subconscious level, like, my mom's influencing me what's coming out a little bit with that i don't know That's you know cool. i like to i like to think that way so john you're a true sales guy at heart like we all are and mm -hmm. uh, yet the power of instagram is also the haters yep so i see them on your page we all have them yeah how do you deal with them um well initially i would be kind of oh wow i'm doing something right here i got these haters coming out of the woodwork and then they kept coming and they kept <laughs> coming and start to find out things about myself that I didn't even realize. It's like, you know, people making fun of my hair. Like, what the hell's wrong with my hair? You know what I mean? And I, I, I got a lisp. I didn't even like, I, you know, I had a, one guy, a guy named Shelton Jordan. I played football with at Notre Dame. Used to make fun of me for having a lisp. Okay. He's the only person in my life that ever said he, he, he's called me John Therathani. He said, Therathani. Maybe he, he said it in fun. He was my buddy. But um, it's the only time I've ever heard about this lisp I had. And now Instagram was a, Haters, every other comment from a hater, nice lisp, you know, and then they'll maybe make some homophobic phrase towards me or something like that with the lisp. Like, you know what, man, that's, that's kind of messed up. But I like started to really embrace it. So I'm like, that's a kind of a foolish comment. So I go to the person's profile. I look at their profile picture. I look at their page actually and find like the most kind of bad, like make funnable picture that I could find of them. And I will screenshot it. And then I put it on my story and then I copy and paste what their comment was. You know, like nice lisp, you know, you know, gay slur. And then they'll put it above it. And then I'll like draw like the cartoon line, like like it's coming out of his mouth, which is all true. And then I'll tag the person in it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, people people eat that up. I did it like once just to kind of be funny. <laughs> more, more, more. And if they really, if they really um, deserve it, I'll make an actual reel about them. Um, so there was a guy that had on his bio real estate investor, and uh, he called me the biggest douche on, on Instagram. Biggest douche? Wow. Yeah, the Big biggest number. the biggest douche on Instagram. So I started off with like, yeah, I want to introduce you to my friend Anthony here. And I pop this picture up there. And he's like, he's a real estate investor, but he had this to say about me. And then I continue to go on and. It's kind of like a compromising picture of like him and like this woman and they're both wearing like matching eyeglasses. So I said, you know, it's, instead of coming, making fun of me for my advice as a real estate investor, you might be able to listen and you and your girlfriend wouldn't have to go 
two for one glasses shopping at Costco. <laughs> and uh yeah, but but my but <laughs> I gotta tell you, it made some of my core followers when I first started because I used to only do business advice and now it's like expanded. Uh, people just think I'm funny, I think. <laughs> it's like but wanna watch me gamble or whatever. So it's a bigger audience now. But like the core people at first, I have a buddy of mine in Barrington Hills. His name's Andrew Stoltman. He's a, a lawyer. He's a big SEC attorney. He's on, one of the talking heads on Fox News all the time. And he's one of my good friends. And he says to me, dude, quit doing this stuff. Like, you know, what a lion care about what the sheep say? You know, and then people say like that stuff to me. Dude, don't quit paying attention. It makes people feel like uncomfortable. Kept doing it though. And it grows on you. People, people now like live for it. So he, he, even mess, he messaged me like a week ago. He goes, buddy, you were wrong. I was wrong. That's like freaking hilarious. Because if I could find like a picture of like them and their like girlfriend or something like that, I'll, I'll like have like something come out of the girl's mouth, like say something compromising about her husband. My husband, you know. You're a full time media guy. Yeah, exactly. I'm pretty. No, but, no, future in stand up co comedy. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so where can people find you? Um, at John Sarasani on Instagram and uh, TikTok, and then John Sarasani's 2000% raise on YouTube. I think you're pretty soft under all that, and I yeah. actually think that you're really going to look back and measure all your uh, all this by how many people you inspired, and, and I'm definitely inspired sitting here. I think this is a good message and um, really powerful to spend as much time as you are uh, and you don't have to do this and that's what's important so kudos to you and yeah. i can't wait to to read this um i'm in the deep end of the pool with you so yeah. I'm, I'm swimming as hard as i can yeah well you got a big production here you know when, pe when pe people come to ask me like operational advice and stuff for my business my business was me selling insurance having people under me helping me service it and making as much money as we can you got freaking moving pieces to here and stuff I, I i was able to dodge that part of my Professional growth, <laughs> the, the professional headache. Good for you. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Professional Instagram. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. I traded it for that. Okay, so you're a lot tougher than me because the haters really bother me. I like super mull on it. I got to think through your approach and see if I could have enough chops to do it. But um, so you're just so successful and everything seems to go right. What mm -hmm. does get under your skin? <laughs> Wasn't it? Who, who said it? Didn't Donald Trump say he's never, he'll never share his phobias or weaknesses to the world? Why, why would I give you guys the blueprint? Um, I, I, will, I, I will say this. Um, I had a, I, I'm a, I love being like, ex, what, what's the thing? You ever hire a salesperson and you make the person take that test to show if they're going to be good at the sales yeah. job or not? Yeah. And, and those things when I would do it would always tell me stuff about myself. I'd go, how did that test know that about me? And, and one of the things that's always come up for me is I, I, I would always want like acceptance from people. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be the type of salesperson that wants the manager to tell me good job okay. all the time and stuff. You, you thought I was going to be talking about me hiring. I said, no, back when I was a sales rep interviewing for yep. jobs. Um, so it was a challenge for me when I started my company um, to, to like, you're by yourself. So you're having these wins and stuff, but there's no conference trip you're qualifying for. There's no there's no leaderboard that you're looking at and comparing yourself to where you stand from the other reps in the country. You know what I mean? Um, so so finding that within myself was was something, and uh, I think it's something that you know I still look at. And I got to tell you, during that five year period when I worked for somebody else, um, there was a transition at executive level in the region I was in. And um, at that point, we didn't know if I was gonna be sticking around long-term, because the original plan was me to work there till I'm 60, they're buying me when I'm 37, I'm the up-and-comer in the company down the road, and man, that went sideways. That was uh, very long road. <laughs> exactly, so that went sideways, but, but, but before it did, um, there was a position that opened up that I thought had my name on it, and they didn't look at me for that position. And I was like, oh, that's kind of, that's kind of effed up. And uh, it was kind of like a little eye opening to me. As I look back now, they were right. I wasn't the right guy for that job. I, it would have been not good, but I didn't, I didn't know that about myself. Right. So I still got to go to work the next day. You know, they just paid me millions of dollars. I don't want to go pout now. Cause you didn't get some job that would have given you a better job title. And I could be a big baby at work. So, 
so you know it, looking within on my myself that's that's something i look back on um it's a lot i learned about myself those during that employment contract god i so resonate with that i think that um i never wanted to like have to like vouch for myself which is why being your own boss is easier yeah i didn't because you know what if they didn't tell you at a girl yeah Exactly. You know, oh, that's and so I good point. That a lot because you know, I felt like yeah, they write these millions of dollars of checks. Yep. And then I'm in the company, and then I felt like, well, I got to be the manager of the year. Yep. Why? Like, right. It's not part of the employment agreement. But until I was manager of the year of the 13 billion dollar company, I was like, they're gonna find out that I'm not really good. It's imposter syndrome, right? Totally. Yeah, I always thought I was getting overpaid the whole time. When I went, when I was, I, I, I thought everything was. When I got there, I realized I was more talented or as talented than anyone there. But, but during the process of selling the company, I'm like, oh, how much are you guys gonna pay me for this company? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I resonate with everything you just said completely. Oh, you're my favorite person in so long. <laughs> you know, what? Um, it's just that a lot of times that. Uh, you talk to a lot of smart people, mm -hmm. but not a lot of people that inspire you back. So um, thank, thank you. you for that. That was really fun. Thank you.